Merry Christmas. How, how are you? Uh, I saw a few more ties this morning, or it's, it's night, sorry, uh, than we're used to seeing. So way to go there, Chad. But <coughs> Sarah, Sarah's got me covered. She's wearing everybody's ties. So uh, if you were gambling on which service would be easier to get a good seat at, uh, you win. Good job. If you're a guest with us, welcome. Uh, we're thrilled that you're here. If you're visiting with family or just visiting for the first time, <clears throat> uh, welcome to you. We're a community that uh, we fancy ourselves more a movement than an institution. That's the way we're constantly talking to ourselves. And what we mean by that is uh, we recognize that God is a God who wants to be known, that he's a personal uh, transforming God that he wants personal relationship with us. And yet, I think one of the things that we're constantly trying to lean into and remind ourselves is that simultaneously it doesn't stop there with us and our own personal holiness, that God is a God looking for a people, a people who uh, will exist in a community in such a way that even people who don't like God would be bummed if we cease to exist. And so we're constantly talking about gathering and scattering, and that's what we mean by that. <clears throat> it hit us, a co- I don't, my voice, see, that's a compliment to your music because my voice is gone, and I can't sing. Uh, It hit us a couple weeks ago, like, wouldn't it be cool if a couple hundred people or however many people would gather with us and worship, if these people who came together to worship, uh, you know, Christmas and the significance of that, wouldn't it make sense, we thought, if that made a tangible impact in our community? Like, wouldn't it make sense if, like, that made a tangible impact in the lives of the working poor in particular, if it uh, pushed a little bit up against injustice? You know, because, where's my Bible? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> We're celebrating Jesus' birth, but his first sermon, which was like three minutes long, by the way, because that would have been a Jewish sermon, uh, he quoted from Isaiah, he said this. Some of you are going like, where's Jesus' church? Because I want to go there. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Around here, we think of that as both metaphorical and literal. That yes, God is a God who wants to liberate us from our own sin, our own brokenness, whatever uh, vocabulary you use to refer to uh, the sin separation from God problem. And yet at the exact same time, once again, we we think that this is literal. That Jesus and his kingdom, his movement, his church is about pushing up against injustice. That it's about uh, restoring righteousness to the community in which uh, it's impacting. So our idea was what if we all brought socks? Or what if we invited one another to bring socks? And then after our two services were over, we would uh, swing by God's love and we would deposit some socks. You know, because you all have socks in them with holes in them. How much more than the working poor or homeless people? So uh, did anybody bring any socks? Okay, just hold on a second. Uh, We've got to get rid of last service's socks. exactly where it came from. <laughs> uh, Sarah, Sarah asked me, like, hey, Adam, this service, could you stand in front of Lenny? Because I took one right in the nose last service. So, so we did. Okay, let's pray. <clears throat> God, thank you uh, for the opportunity to matter. And we recognize that deep in our souls, deep in our personhood, is this desire for our lives to be bigger than ourself. And, and we believe, God, that you and your kingdom is the ultimate fulfillment of that desire. Uh, That you are the ultimate teacher as it pertains to living lives bigger than ourselves and than about ourselves. So uh, thanks for giving us this little idea uh, that makes a little impact and yet uh, I think does as much for us as it does for the people that we're serving. Uh, We see those socks as an offering to you, God, and we trust you with the fruits that you will uh, bring from that. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> ever notice how strong your desire for something new is? Like uh, how driven you are for that which is new? Now, what exactly you're driven towards, what exactly you want is pretty relative to you and your interests and your personality and all those different things, right? But, but nonetheless, have you ever noticed that you're just compelled by that which is new? You know, whether, whether it's a video game or some toys or some Legos, as is the case with the little ones, or, or whether it's <clears throat> a new experience, a new ski mountain, a new set of skis, uh, whether it's a new relationship or maybe you're a style person and it's a new look, new clothes, or maybe they're not new clothes but they're new to you like Mara, right? Like, uh, but have you just noticed how much you need that which is new? 
Like you're compelled towards having new experiences. Isn't this why we like to travel? Why we like new foods? Why, why, we, uh, why we work and we spend and we have budgets that are largely set aside for that which we already own, but we're going to replace it, right? Just uh, step back and went like, wow. If I'm not careful, I could easily conclude that what causes me to want to live, what drives me forward in life, is the compelling nature of that which is new. But then along comes something like Christmas. And at Christmas, I would submit to you that we're reminded that we, we do not just want that which is new. We want that which we are familiar with. Uh, Christmas maybe being the greatest example of this. I don't think it's the only, but maybe the easiest time of year to talk about this. Uh, the food. I mean, aren't there cookies? Like grandma better make her cookies, right? There's uh, mom better make those white almond bark pretzel things. There's the Chex Mix. I don't know what it is in your family, peanut brittle, but somebody better make fudge, right? There, there's the foods. And some of you have these traditions. In, in mine, it's uh, butter balls, which sounds disgusting, right? Like it's eggs and bread and, and butter. And you compress them into balls, freeze them, and then you take uh, chicken soup stuff. What is that called? Like chicken broth and pre-cooked rice. I mean, doesn't this just sound disgusting? And then you take these butter balls and you dump them into this and they call this soup and then you eat them. I'm a food snob. I'm a, a soggy food snob. And as I describe butter balls to myself, I go like, that's disgusting. You're a hypocrite. Because like on Christmas Eve, it's about the butter balls. Uh, I've got a friend who, he was inviting my wife and I over for breakfast on Christmas morning, and he was saying, oh yeah, in our family, I can't remember, it was like monkey brains, it wasn't monkey brains, it was something exotic. I was like, what is that? It's eggs and hot dogs, he said. It's so good. Like, you're so delusional, that's disgusting. <laughs> right? like, there's, there's these foods that, like, it's what makes Christmas Christmas, and it's not just uh, food either, is it? I mean, this is what can make Christmas also very grief-filled. Because if you're celebrating it without people that you've celebrated it with in the past, it ceases to be Christmas in your emotional makeup. And it's not just food either. It's places, it's where we go, it's how we do things. Uh, There's the gift thing. I mean, couldn't we say that this is what makes uh, a young relationship difficult? Like some of the biggest fights that new married couples have are at this time of year, right? And it's really ridiculous if you step back from it, but it's these conversations about Christmas Eve or Christmas Day and when do we open gifts and how do we open gifts, right? Like, do, do, we, do we give them all to everybody at one time and then they tear through them at their leisure or do we just give one person at a time presents and is there like a person who's in charge of distributing them and how do we buy gifts? Like, does everybody get a gift or does nobody get a gift? Like, uh, you, you might be someone that's like, no, Christmas isn't about gifts at all and so we don't do gifts, but you might marry somebody who's like, no gifts, Like we spend our next four months salary on gifts and we spend the next four months paying off Visa in order to pay for our gifts. And then there's these conversations about do we buy everybody a gift or do we gift exchange? Like uh, you come from a family where everybody gets a $10 gift that, you know, they won't use. Or do you come from a family where you just pick one name and you buy them gifts? I mean, Christmas, we could go on and on with the way these uh, traditions are embedded in us. They're Santa Claus. Could I just suggest to you that if there was any other context in which there was a heavy set person uh, with a long white beard who was elderly, who wore red velvet and told you that you needed to stand in two lines and then he was going to charge you money to have your child sit on his lap, like in normal circumstances, you would have that person arrested, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not okay. And yet, no, no, not, not in our tradition, right? Like, uh, some, and it's not just kids. Like I have cousins who as adults they sit on Santa's lap together and they get a picture. What is that? Well, it's creepy, right? Like, but we're compelled to that which we are familiar. And then there's the music. It's bad music, right? Like Jingle Bells is a very terrible song. And the reason I say that, I just assume you agree with me is because if you were to come over to my house on January 1st and I played Jingle Bells, you would leave, right? If you walked into Target and they were playing Jingle Bells on uh, December 27th, you're going to find the store manager, or if you're that guy, right, like that type A, like, blah, 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 and you're going to find the manager and say, like, dude, Jingle Bells? It's terrible music. Why do we want it? Because it, like, it's what makes Christmas Christmas. There's like this compelling nature to be familiar with things. Jingle Bells? Like, that? Eh, what? Why? Well, because we sang it when I was a kid, and my parents sang it when they were kids, and like George Washington sang it, and I'm pretty sure that Jesus himself sang Jingle Bells, right? <laughs> 
Speaking of uh, terrible traditional music, uh, I invite you to turn your attention to the screen. Yeah. <laughs> if you're a guest with us, you've been introduced to our sense of humor, which you may or may not approve of. Uh, <clears throat> but I do want to ask this question, so okay. Why this odd concoction? Because to say that our desires consist solely of that which is new is inaccurate. Christmas reminds us that we are compelled uh, by tradition. We're compelled by that which we are familiar with. Why, why is that? Uh, what happens there? The, the text, uh, it, it suggests something. And I guess this is what I want to lay out in front of you for your consideration tonight. Did, did you know that in the Jewish uh, religious calendar, there are 37 days of festival? 37 days out of the year, there are lunar calendars, so uh, it's not 365 days, it's fewer than that. Uh, 37 days a year, God doesn't just encourage, but actually commands the Jewish people to celebrate. 37 days a year where he says, uh, stop what you're doing, withdraw from the monotony, withdraw from the everyday, and celebrate. Sometimes in the context of a family's home, sometimes uh, in the community itself, sometimes in Jerusalem. And like some of you are thinking like, wow, my boss kind of hoses me because I get 14, right? Like 37, and we, we're not even talking about Sabbaths yet. Like that's its own deal, which the leverage for those of you that are the boss, uh, because I know your pain, uh, here, here's your leverage. Yeah, and it was a six-day work week, and it started when the sun came up, and it ended when the sun went down. So you just do that math, and I think you'll come out ahead. Anyway, 37 days a year, 37 days a year uh, where you celebrate. Why? Is it because uh, God is a God who recognizes uh, the value of identity formation that happens in those festivals? Is God a God who understood that life will get going fast and we'll forget stuff? Like, is God a God who wanted people to withdraw, to be uh, reminded of who he is, who I am, who we are, and what he's done? Right, there's Passover, the most sacred for sure of the Jewish festivals, uh, one that from cover to cover in the text essentially is a metaphor for salvation. Passover, which uh, is the celebration of when the Jews were liberated from Egypt. And it's the season where the Jews are just reminded of how God rescued them from themselves and their sin, rescued them from bondage, and brought them out into this new life. There's Sukkot, a festival still celebrated today in which Jews build a temporary dwelling in their driveways, oftentimes, and they sleep in it for seven days. You call that camping, they call it Sukkot. And the whole purpose is to be reminded of the 40 years wandering in the wilderness when they didn't have homes over their head. Is it about identity? And is that desire in you that needs Christmas, that needs tradition, that needs familiar stuff, is it really about identity? and your desire to be deeply rooted in who you are. I mean, I think we can all agree that we want to be forward-thinking, uh, aggressive-living people. But does that require uh, roots that go deep in who we are and what our values are, what our makeup is? Enter the Christmas story. I'm going to set that train of thought aside for just a moment, and we'll return to it. Uh, if you're new to the Bible, there's two places where you can go. Uh, to hear the narratives that we're celebrating on Christmas. One is Matthew, the other is Luke. I'm going to read from Luke's version. It says this, In those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This is the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone out to his own, went out to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to, Jude to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house in the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in the manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with, angel, with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angel had left him and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. 
So they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread word concerning what had been, what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Now, in our culture, uh, Christmas is kind of the climax of the whole year, isn't it? I mean, everything kind of builds up to it for most of us. And, you know, it's, everything's to Christmas and away from Christmas. It's the climax of our culture. And, and, and then there's these conversations, and I understand that there's these conversations about, uh, particularly from well-intentioned uh, spiritual Christ-following people, the desire to keep Christmas about the right stuff. And there's these conversations about don't smell Christmas with an X because it's somehow, you know, an abomination to God. I'm not sure that I buy that. But just in case, uh, my family's implemented some rules. You can't call it Xbox, it's the Christ box. <laughs> and when they get hurt, they have Christ race. <laughs> I was proud, you didn't even laugh, and I stole those jokes. <clears throat> Seriously, uh, our intention tonight isn't really to talk to you about how to celebrate. My point in the 37 days and the need for tradition is simply this. I, I, it's not about how you celebrate, but the point is that you celebrate. That God is a God who would want you to celebrate. That the context uh, in the text is the precedent of God's interaction with humanity over the course of hum human existence, and in particular since establishing Israel, is he has established these days. He values the role that celebrations have in grounding his people in who they are. God is a God who understands that the other 360 odd days can draw you away from this beautiful thing that we call the incarnation that can cost you your awe of who you are because of who Christ is because of what he has done. We talk a lot around here about the mundane, the everyday, and the value of the other six days. And for sure, God transforms us in those other days. I guess my point tonight is... Uh, but God values parties. I mean, call them what they, we want. Festivals, holidays, I don't know. You can drink Welch's grape juice if you want. God is a God who values the role of celebration, who values the role of how tradition can ingrain in us things that we already know. This is why we're always talking about the baby in the manger, right? Because it's so central to who we are as people if we believe that the baby in that manger was Jesus. I heard a story from a family who, uh, the husband, it was Christmas season, and time to decorate, and he was going to be traveling a lot, and so he decided he was going to be a good husband, and he was going to help his wife decorate, because he was going to be gone for a bit. And so the first thing he did is he went to the garage, and he grabbed uh, the, one of the mini nativity scenes that they had, but this one was a particularly important one. It's made in Rome, and apparently a big deal, and expensive, and uh, valuable, and all those different things. And as he pulled the box down off the storage shelf, he looked into it, and it was filled with dog food. My friend's no genius, well, maybe he is, but uh, no offense. But he knows that dog food crammed into a box means meeses, right, or mice. It means that, ah, uh, that thing's been full of mice at some point. So he brought the box into his house. He alerted the authorities that the mice had been in his nativity scene. And so he and his wife teamed up. And after disposing of the dog food, he would unwrap the nativity characters from the tissue paper, hand them to his wife who would scrub them with bleach and all of that stuff, and then he would take the tissue paper and throw it into the fireplace with fire going. So on the process went. Finally, all the pieces were clean. So they kind of dried them off and brought them back to the fireplace, and they were getting ready to place them. And in fact, they did place them. And then they realized that baby Jesus was missing. And so, you know, they had one of those husband and wife moments that when they tell you the story is much more dignified, I'm sure, than it was in that moment. And they started to search, and he said, well, it, it's, uh, he thought it was made of clay. And so he said, well, there'll be some remnant of it in the fire. And so he stuck the little fire prodder in the fire, and no remnants. So, so he Googled the name of whatever the thing it was made out of was, and he learned that it wasn't actually clay. It was a uh, type of wood. So now they joke that either the rat stole baby Jesus or, like, he incinerated him. <laughs> but the baby Jesus is a big deal in the story, and Luke makes much of the manger but not because it was a manger. I just want to talk real briefly about something, and I hope I can bring all these different threads together. Three times, three times uh, Luke mentions the manger. In verse 7, first of all says, She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a 
manger. So this Christ child gets put in a manger. Then in verse 11, it says, Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. These are the angels talking to the shepherds. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Christ was a government title for Caesar. This wasn't a new religious term for these people. This was a claim that this child isn't just another child, this infant, not just another infant. This is the real king of the world. That's the assertion. And then the angel said, and you'll find him, and you will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. So the manger is about how do we find this guy? And then in verse 16, so they hurried off and found Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. Here's the deal. When the shepherds got to the manger, they had to make the same decision each and every one of us has to make. Is this another baby? Valuable and significant because it's human life. Or is this more than just another baby? Is this baby lying in this manger, the king of the world, the real ruler, the awaited Messiah, the savior? Like this Christmas Eve, the the privilege of leading a Christmas Eve service is, is obviously new to us. We're a church plant. And as I've watched over the last 10 years, friends lead worship services on Christmas Eve and Easter. What I've always thought was the point was to take a familiar narrative and put new light on it, right? Because we all show up here wanting to hear the same story and it would somehow be sacrilegious if we came here and we like talked about Galatians 5. Like it just wouldn't feel appropriate on Christmas Eve. I always thought that the pressure on me was to take a familiar passage and shed new light on it. And I think largely thanks to a couple of theologians, one being Scott McKnight, I've been convicted uh, that, that I think I was 180 degrees wrong. I don't think Christmas Eve is about new information at all. I think Christmas Eve is about information that we've already had. Christmas Eve isn't about learning something new, but being reminded of something we already knew. Christmas Eve isn't that time in our spiritual journey where we're driven forward by learning new stuff and making new observations. Christmas Eve is God's gift to us where we can rock back on our heels a little bit and allow a truth that is incredibly important, that God became a man to die for our sins and just let it simmer in our hearts for a bit. Christmas, I submit to you, is about that which we are already familiar with. Christmas is God's gift to say, hey, center yourself on the truth of the incarnation. Let me pray over you as the band comes back up. Let me just take a moment in the solitude of your own chair and reflect with God in whatever way you're comfortable. and Think. Talk to God if you're comfortable. Maybe just thank him for Christmas. Lord God, uh, thank you for Christmas. For those of us who have relationship with you, God, what compels us so often in our spiritual lives is new information and new data, new observations, new challenges. We recognize that maybe the biggest challenge of all on Christmas is to be reminded and in awe of the truth that we already knew, that in Christ, God became a person. You became a person. God, for friends that are here who maybe don't have a relationship with you or it's just bland, that you would remind them, that you would help them to be acquainted with the fact that that wasn't just another baby, but the king. And that if that's true, everything's different. Amen.